I guess you can say. Right. Uh, so the, the title that I chose for today, is there any way that the house lights can be moved up or do I have to stay with seeing this blob of darkness here? I don't know if anyone can hear it, but if there is a possibility, that'll be great. So um, I titled this talk, Web Science, an Exploratorium for Understanding and Enabling Social Networks. And I did that because I think about social networks as, as being just a natural ally in terms of, of web science. It's by no means the only way of doing this, uh, but yet I would, I would argue, and I'm gonna make a case here, that it's a very powerful ally in terms of both helping, contributing to web science, and benefiting from web science itself. So the, 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 little, uh, the little picture that you see on the right-hand side there is of uh, an article that appeared in Wired Magazine a few years ago, and it was called Sniff, Social Networking in Fur as in dogs, and the idea was that you have this, uh, it was built by the lab, by the folks at the Media Lab at MIT, and it's a little collar that you put on a dog, and it has a USB drive and an IR beam, infrared beam on it, and once the dog has the collar and goes around playing with other dogs, each time it comes across another dog that has a similar collar, they exchange business card information, and by the time you come home at the end of the day, you take the dog's collar out, you take the USB drive, you put it into your computer, and you have a network picture of all the dogs that your dog likes to hang out with. And then you can go and click on that and see who that dog is that your dog is so interested in. And then I know that the ideas were to create dog dates on the basis of this. And as Wired Magazine said, you make the move from social networking to social pet working. Uh, unfortunately, this is not just about dogs. There is also in Japan something called the Love Getty. And the Love Getty was very popular a few years ago. Um, it may still be. But when I was in Kyoto and Osaka, and just like the Tomagachi, and you put it on your, on, your, on, your, on your belt, and the kids, all the kids would walk around in Osaka and Kyoto, and they would all have these little love getties with them, and they would program it with the kind of food, music, and movies that they like, and the kind of food, music, and movies that they would like in a potential love partner. And then they'd put it on their holster, on their belt, and every now and then you see the kids on the street giggling and trying to see whether their love getty was either flashing or beeping or buzzing. And any time it did, they'd look around to see who else was flashing or beeping or buzzing, and there you'd have a potential love partner that they would have in that. So um, I, why did I start with these two things? The reason I started with these two things is because it shows us something really interesting about what is happening with social networks. We have talked a lot about the web in general, the internet in general for that matter, as helping us to, f to be able to communicate, collaborate, coordinate with anyone, anytime, any place. The potential is incredible. What is not so clear until quite recently is who it is, how do we use the same technologies to identify who it is that we may want to communicate, collaborate, et cetera, with. Just because we can do it with anyone, that doesn't mean we do it with random people. And I'll talk in the, in the presentation and we'll have some results that sort of reinforce that same set of issues. So even more important than before, understanding the social motivations for why we create these network links is becomes an important part of understanding, both understanding the web as well as enabling the web. And so that's the reason I see that connection between social network analysis and, and web science in general. So since it is so dark in here, and um, I'm going to assume that some of you are gonna fall off, and that's quite all right. So before you do, I just wanna give you the key takeaways of the talk, and then you can take a nap, and then we'll make, we'll make, make sure you get up at the end of it. So these are my key takeaways. This is really the key takeaway from this talk. I think, and I've been convinced of this even before this meeting, but much more so after seeing the two days of presentations here, that web science is really well poised to make a quantum intellectual leap by facilitating collaboration that leverages recent advances in four areas, theory, data, methods, and computational infrastructure. Social science theories have an incredible amount of richness to contribute about why we create, maintain, and dissolve our network links. Uh, having said that, I think social science is lagging behind in understanding that while we know a lot from, so, from previous theory and research about why we create, maintain, dissolve links amongst humans, we have done a terrible job of ignoring the fact that these social networks of humans are embedded in larger multidimensional networks. And I'll talk more about that. These are networks that include other resources like data sets, documents, analytic tools, uh, concepts. And so there is an incredible opportunity here for social science theory, not only to contribute, but also to advance in its own right the understanding of these uh, multidimensional networks. Uh, again, I'm going to make the argument that we have now incredible amounts of data because of the developments of things like semantic web, like the web 2.0, we have now the technolog technological capability both to capture, to store, to merge, to query, 
uh, what I'm calling relational metadata that is needed to more effectively both understand and enable these communities. The third point I'm going to make is we also have really powerful methods, both qualitative methods as well as quantitative methods. And in particular, I'll talk about one method in the area of network analysis called P-star or exponential random graph models that provide us a way to move beyond descriptions of networks to real inferential hypothesis testing within the network sphere. And then finally, all of this is going to require, as we have discovered to our own chagrin at times, an incredible computation infrastructure. We cannot do the kinds of analysis that we want on traditional machines or uh, laptops or even smaller machines. Uh, we, at, and as I'll mention, uh, for some of our projects, we have 60 terabytes of data. Uh, and sitting on the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. And NCSA has been assigned at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Uh, we really, both, of, both cloud computing and petascale applications are a critical part of being able to understand and enable the kinds of networks we're talking about here. So that's my key takeaways. So this is a plot that I got from John Kelly. John Kelly is a PhD student at Columbia, and he works at the Berkman Center at Harvard. And this is his network maps of the language, uh, the, all these different languages, the blog structures by language. So it's a structure of the blogosphere by language. And you see immediately that there are some distinct differences between the blog structure of English, Portuguese, Chinese, which looks very different, uh, Persian, that looks very different. And just intuitively, by looking at it visually, we are seeing here yeah, the same kinds of things that we heard yesterday um, in, in, the, in the presentation, the keynote by Nigel, right? So I'm really using Nigel's presentation as a way of pivoting to say there was a lot there that we saw of these macro structures that obviously need some explanation. And we look at these structures and we can say, oh, gee, do they have power law? Do they have small world? Do they have uh, hubs and attractors? They have all these sort of macro level structures. And just as Nigel pointed out, the time has come for us to move beyond it's recognizing these macro structures and for us to begin to understand what are the underlying generative mechanisms that create these macro structures. And I think that's at the heart of a lot of what social science can contribute. What are the generative mechanisms that explain the emergent structures that is observed in large scale networks? I was also pleasantly surprised to see, to recognize that the web science process model that has been presented here, where you look at the micro, the macro, and then the socio-technical, actually fits in very well and is in the spirit of being able to understand the circular way of looking at different ideas that happen at the micro level, understanding what kinds of macro intended and unintended consequences result from it, and then see that cycle repeat itself again. So what are these generative mechanisms? In a, in a book that my collaborator Peter Manji from the University of Southern California and myself wrote, and in a subsequent article that I did with Wasserman and Faust, we actually go through the literature in the social sciences and try to understand the various motivations that we have for creating, maintaining, and dissolving, and reconstituting these network links. What are the generative mechanisms? Why do we really create these links? Well, the first one is, and this is the Cliff Notes version of the book, um, the, first version, uh, the first one is theories of self-interest. I want to create a link with Nigel because I want something that Nigel has, and so that creates that uh, motivation to do it. The only problem is that Nigel may never return my calls. And so what you have is an economic model that works some of the time, but not all of the time. And so it's, it's a model that it works on the principle of maximizing your individual utility function, and that can work only some of the time. A more robust may, may be social exchange or resource exchange. And this says that I want to create a link with, with Wendy because I want something Wendy has, but Wendy wants something I have. And so that creates a social exchange process. Each one is getting some benefit from it. That has a more likely, um, greater likelihood of succeeding. A third one may be that I want to create a link with Jim, not because I want anything from Jim or Jim wants anything from me, but together we have a better shot of getting something from a third party. And if you think about it, this is the building block for all collective action. Anything that we bring together to set standards, for lobbying, for political movements, that's a major reason for doing it. Look on the right-hand side, the reason that I may want to create a link uh, with uh, David is not because I want anything from David or David wants anything from me or the two of us have a good shot of getting something from a third party. The reason I want to create a link with him is because everyone else is connected to him. So that's how you get these preferential attachment models where I'm just, by contagion, I'm infected with the idea. I look around and I see everyone is talking to him and so I may want to go get a connection to him. Uh, a balanced situation would be different. So I may want to create a link with Helen because I happen to know Bill and Bill happens to know Helen. So you like to hang out with friends of your friends. 